as you know, at the DH uh, seminar, we usually have two internal speakers uh, and two external speakers. And, uh, so, um, so, well, we're going to have two more, the external ones. On October 19th, we're going to have Heather Richards, who is set up from the University of Nebraska. <coughs> and on November 16th, we're going to have Lori Emerson from the University of uh, Colorado Boulder. Uh, but today, most importantly, we have Pam Lack. Uh, Pam Lack is the head of the Center for Faculty Initiatives and Engagement at the University of Kansas Libraries. She has a PhD in U.S. cultural history with an emphasis on gender and field history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which she got in 2007. She also has an MS in Information Science from UNC School of Information and Library Science uh, from 2012. And prior to coming to KU, which she just said in March, um, she was the Associate Director of the Digital Innovation Lab at UNC, where she oversaw the work of the lab and was the Project Manager for DH Press, a WordPress-based digital humanities visualization toolkit. Pan is interested in how new and emerging technologies can support and redefine scholarship and pedagogy in the humanities and hopes to bridge the divide between technologies and humanists. And today, she's going to present a very witty talk, judging <laughs> from the title, uh, which is a uh, title of uh, What is it that humanities and what's it doing in the classroom? And uh, please let me, uh, help me welcome. Uh, Thank you, Elka. I'm already thinking that I'm going to fail at this witty talk, um, <laughs> this wonderful setup, but thank you so much. Um, well, as Elika sort of mentioned, um, the title of my talk is, is quite purposeful. What is Digital Humanities and What's It Doing in the Classroom? Which is a play on uh, Matthew Kirschenbaum's piece, What is Digital Humanities and What's It Doing in English Departments? from the Bulletin of the Association of Departments of English uh, from 2010 and reprinted in the Debates in the Digital Humanities uh, in the, that edition, which was from 2012. And in this piece, he tried to make the case for the, the, that digital humanities belong squarely in English departments. Um, and he argued that digital humanities um, was defined as the intersection of computing and the humanities, and therefore was inherently interdisciplinary. Unlike other more so-called traditional humanities um, practices, it was highly social and relied on collaboration, social networks, and it was often public-facing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that formed a very um, important foundational definition of digital humanities to which people have been adding and debating ever since and even before that. Um, and I would add something very important to that, that digital humanities carries the promise of new modes of knowledge production, and in particular, uh, the democratization of knowledge production. But just as, many, um, just as there are many definitions of DH floating around out there, there are a lot of people who refuse to define digital humanities. And Ryan Cordell, who is an assistant professor of English at Northeastern, in a wonderful post, How Not to Teach Digital Humanities, argues that the act of definition is in and of itself exclusionary. Because by saying this is digital humanities, we say that something outside of this is not. And if I do DH and it looks like this, then you do not. And so it's a very alienating thing to do in our classes to try to define it. Moreover, Lumping uh, or attaching digital to the term humanities is not necessarily productive in that humanities does not necessarily mean the same thing to everybody. And do we take the time to really define what that means with our students? If you look at different universities, different institutions, different disciplines fall in the humanities. I was actually shocked to learn a few years ago that history at UNC is classified as a social science, even though I think of myself squarely as a humanist, and I, I was very upset when I learned I was technically a social scientist. Um, and then was forced to take a social science research methods class. Um, not forced, I was encouraged. Um, as well, um, his final point about why we shouldn't define digital humanities in the classroom is that we shouldn't presume that our students are digital natives. So even though increasingly the students that we teach are born into a world of technology, Increasingly, they don't remember a time before cell phones, or smartphones, or Facebook. That doesn't mean they're digital natives. That doesn't mean they're comfortable with technology, that they're better at using it than we are. 
And by assuming that, we sort of take this leap and we ignore and forget about people who aren't comfortable with digital technology. And for people who are coming to us from across the digital divide, who maybe come from small rural communities that don't have as good uh, an internet infrastructure, we put them at a disadvantage right away. So with that, I'm going to not define digital humanities, or at least not define it any further, and launch into uh, the pedagogy side of this talk, what to doing in the classroom. And to begin, I'm just going to trace really, really quickly my own evolution into a digital humanist. Um, I started out as a conventional history graduate student working alone in my graduate carol in the Davis Library, surrounded by my books, my precious books. And this was in the middle of my uh, dissertation days. I was just about to head off to a major research trip and finish the writing of the dissertation. And then eventually I went back to school to get a degree in information science, originally to become a digital archivist. Had never heard the term digital humanities, but needed a job and was hired to be a project manager by um, a professor of American studies who was starting to go digital. I had no idea what digital humanities was, but suddenly I was doing it. And so if Laura in the last DH seminar talked about being a reluctant DHer, I would call myself an accidental DHer. <laughs> I tripped into it before I even knew what it was. And suddenly there I was, working with technology, working with students. And this evolution really happened in the classroom. Because the work that I was doing as a, an RA for this faculty member, most of it was happening in the classroom. That is, the work, the projects that we were doing were being staged in the classroom. So my own evolution really mirrors my pedagogic evolution, pedagogical evolution. So just one more pause to give you a little bit of an institutional context, because I think that this matters. Um, so when I started um, working for this faculty member, we were just sort of working on a project with the libraries. But the College of Arts and Sciences at UNC asked him to make a proposal for innovation in the humanities. And he proposed a, the Digital Innovation Lab, which was intended to be an interdisciplinary digital humanities center, though it's administratively housed in the Department of American Studies. Um, and it, we got the green light to start it, and I got folded into the lab, and in fact became the first manager of the lab. I was still a graduate student at the time, so I was a half-time manager of the lab. And then um, once I graduated, I became full-time and then the associate director. It was an interesting time at UNC because just as we were starting the lab, every department at UNC had been asked to revise its promotion and tenure guidelines to address, among other things, collaborative scholarship and the use of technology. So this was a really great moment to be getting into the DH game at Carolina because there was this mandate being handed down from above saying, we need to start doing this, and we need to start evaluating people on this and rewarding them for doing this. In the first year of the lab, we were asked to go to the Mellon Foundation and pitch a proposal for a larger DH program, um, which even though we didn't actually get to pitch it, our, our chancellor, who was a chemist, did that for us. Um, we were funded. And in order to get that Mellon, we secured almost three and a half million dollars in institutional support to show Mellon just how serious the university was at supporting and building a sustainable model of digital humanities. And so we started a, a roughly four to five year $5 million initiative to expand digital humanities at Carolina. Part of that entailed um, investing in our current faculty and developing them as DHers, getting them to teach DH courses, attracting new faculty to be DH faculty, and then building up a program for graduate students, in particular a graduate certificate program in digital humanities. Now unfortunately, this version of the grant did not address undergraduate learning at all, and the team is going to be going back to Mellon this spring, and I'm hopeful that they actually will include undergraduate learning in um, their new approach to, to Mellon. So we, um, while the lab didn't get any money from the Mellon, we got all of this institutional support because we became the hub of all of this activity. And we actually, um, where we had started as a virtual space, we were squatting in a coffee shop downtown and actually put the coffee shop out of business. We finally were able to get a, a space in um, a central building on campus. It was a decommissioned classroom. And we suddenly had this space to do things, to meet with people, to have the kind of collaborative and serendipitous conversations that are so necessary to doing DH work. So that's the context in which I was operating. So now I want to give you a couple examples of the 
types of things we were trying to do in the classroom. And I'm trying to position it as a spectrum from, on the one end, digitally inflected teaching. So it's teaching that sort of pulls in tools here and there, um, but isn't really particularly transformative in what it's teaching or what the students are doing or learning. All the way to the other end of the spectrum, much more digitally centered, um, much more about DH work in some way or another. So to begin with, <clears throat> When I first started um, teaching with this one faculty member who would go on to found the lab, we were teaching an undergraduate class uh, that was studying the history of the development of towns and cities in North Carolina in the first part of the 20th century. And it was a fairly conventional, small, um, upper level class, but the students used um, digital archived objects and produced digital blogs in a collaborative blog environment. Um, and so in this case, uh, they were write, sort of blogging thematically as a group. And this blog was about um, the rise of segregated neighborhoods in North Carolina towns and cities. And what the students had to do was go through and do the digital research and then try to present it both in a coherent way and in an aesthetic way. And so this student was trying to play around with marking up a map um, to show a segregated neighborhood. Um, and so by doing this, the students were learning the art of primary research and how to use technology to create and display historical arguments. Um, and the most interesting thing was the way that they learned to work around um, either data abundance or data scarcity. So in the case of this town, Fayetteville, uh, there was not a lot of material, so the student had to dig really, really deep to make arguments. And someone sitting next to her had too many, um, too many records to work with and had to find a way to manage having too much stuff. And so we would talk about that methodology. At the same time that we were teaching this undergraduate class, which we co-taught three times, and I was the RA slash TA for that class, we were teaching an, a graduate class in American Studies that was intended to field test a tool that we were developing that was the prototype of what we then went on to develop as DH Press, um, which was a, is a visualization toolkit. And so what we would do is we taught this class three times, before the class would start, I would set up a, a project. Um, I would arrange for an external client. I would scope a project, agree with the client on the deliverables, what the time frame would be. And then on the first day of class, the students would come to class and we would give them a menu of projects to work, work on. They would choose one, and then they were off and working. Um, and this is an example of the kind of project scope that I gave, so it would talk about the description of the project, who the intended audience was, the deliverables, all sorts of different things. And the intent of this was that at the end of the semester, the students would turn the project over to the client, and the client would adopt the project and maintain it thereafter. Um, I'm going to talk over this, but this is a demo of one of the final projects that we So this is an example of the type of project that students were working with. This was in the final semester, spring 2013. We had scrapped the tool that we had already tested in two classes and started building a new one when we taught this class. So the tool was being built as we were teaching the class. So it was very tricky for students to be able to figure out how to execute a project when the tool wasn't completed. And every week I'd come in and show them a new thing and then something would break and then we'd have to debug it, and then we'd come back a week later, and something else would break, and then we'd have to debug it, and then we'd come back the next week. So it was very um, anxiety-producing for some of our students. This is an early, early prototype of what would become DH Press. Um, but at any rate, um, the students had to sort of feel around in the dark and figure out how to make this happen. And I'm going to pause that. So there was a lot that worked really well in this model and a lot that didn't. Um, so it was a great experience for students to work with real life clients in real space projects that had to launch. In some cases had very firm launch dates because it was around a event opening or something like that. Um, 
places where we really struggled, some of the teams had um, sort of, as you would expect, bad team dynamics, and they could never really get out of the norming phase of, of group work. Um, I was supposed to be the overarching project manager for all of the projects, but I was a student myself and working half time in the lab, so I didn't really have the time to do the kind of project management work that needed to be done for some of these teams. Some didn't need it, and everyone had their own mini project manager, but they, but they needed someone else with them to guide them through it. So that was a bit uneven. Um, and there was a lack of long-term support for these projects. I, um, last night, went to go take some screenshots of one of these projects, and it's still technically up there, but it looked terrible because the last platform upgrade at the library made it, rendered it kind of um, not very usable. And in fact, the library had decided to, uh, in your two um, original platform versions of the class, the platform that we were using, which was supported by the library, the library has since decided to discontinue supporting it, and all the projects have to get migrated but there's not really anyone around to migrate them. Although I did export all the data, just in case someone does want to do that. The really ugly part of all of this was that ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, we were working with very buggy tools, tools that were not complete, tools that didn't do what they purported to do, and some students could not handle the ambiguity of that. And we did not address that in our assessment. So while I wasn't the instructor of record and wasn't responsible for the formal assessment of the students, um, there was nothing in the syllabus that said, like, don't worry if the project doesn't work. This is what we're looking for. We're, we're going to evaluate you on your effort, not on the final product. We didn't address that at all in the syllabus. So some students were okay with that, and others could not handle it. And some students actually had to drop the class as a result. Many of the projects, including the one I just showed, were proof of concept, but were never completed. And even though these were projects for actual clients, we just couldn't marshal the resources to keep them going. And, and that's been really unfortunate. Um, and part of that, I think, was just trying to do too much with too few resources. Um, at the same time that I was uh, working on these classes, I actually had the opportunity to teach as an overload at a nearby sister school, teach and be the instructor of record in a graduate public history class, um, an experimental class to try to introduce digital history into the curriculum. I taught eight museum studies students um, and we would meet once a week um, in this Introduction to Digital Public History Practices class. And the goal of it was to just expose them to digital history, to things like digital exhibits and, and other things like that, so that if they had a, a board member or a team member at the museum that they were working at um, would say, like, oh, we should do a digital project, they wouldn't run screaming from the room. And so it blended a traditional seminar with um, a weekly tool workshop and tool assessment um, with a self-defined and executed project. So each student did their own DH project from start to finish. They tended to be related to the, honor, uh, to the master's thesis that they were working on. But they had to go through all of these milestones and basically traverse a very rapid project life cycle. So from project proposal to work plan, defining their outcomes and audiences, uh, to an impact statement and an evaluation statement, um, they have to provide, do an in-class demo, and then adjust it for a final launch. And then once they launched their projects, they had to provide critical feedback of all the other projects, and then do a, a reflection and self-assessment. So it was really a rapid-fire DH project, but they, they all were able to execute a project from start to finish in about 15 weeks, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, there were some obstacles and some opportunities with this. Um, the number one problem is persistence. Of the eight projects, only one is still alive, and that's partly because of the way I set it up. I didn't have access to resources at this other institution. I bought two years of server space. I told each student to buy a domain name and park it on my server, and I said, you get two years, and then if you want to keep your project going, it's up to you to figure out how to do that. And only one of them actually did that. Um, so that was one challenge, but I decided to do it that way because I wanted to, them to see the process of getting a server stood up and how difficult that can be if you don't have that expertise and you don't have a system sysadmin person sitting next to you the whole time. And so we struggled with that as a group. Um, as you can imagine, it was quite a strain on my time. I, at this point, I was working full time in the lab. I was co-teaching one of the graduate classes um, where we were building that other demo that you saw. And then I was commuting an hour once a week to 
um, teach this class, and then trying to teach, learn the tools so I could teach the tools, create documentation for the students um, in the, in, for tools that didn't have good documentation. And at the end of the day, we were really limited um, in what we could work with based on the limitations of my own knowledge and my own ability to learn things. Um, some students experimented with learning tools that were not part of sort of the prescriptive menu, but um, most of them didn't really venture too far afield from that. But it was a really great experience, and one or two of the students, it really did change how they thought about technology, which was not necessarily my intention. And um, one of them actually, who was kind of the most skeptical of digital history, went on to get a summer inter internship doing a, a website redesign for a local museum, and was kind of surprised to find that he actually liked it and was good at it. Um, again, I wasn't trying to convert anybody, but I just wanted them to be exposed to and comfortable with these uh, concepts. One final example. Um, um, I mentioned earlier that um, when we got this large Millen grant, part of um, what that entailed was setting up the Graduate Certificate in Digital Humanities. There were only so many classes at the graduate level at Carolina at that time, although students could take X number of classes at nearby schools. Um, so we needed to start populating classes to allow students to actually get their certificate in a timely manner. The one that we agreed to offer was a Graduate Practicum in Digital Humanities in which students would work for eight hours a week in the lab under my supervision on existing and ongoing projects and just be thrown into that real life situation, um, a real environment. <clears throat> so it combined a traditional seminar taught by the instructor of record. I co-taught the class three times but never got to be the instructor of record, largely for bureaucratic reasons um, due to the structures at UNC at the time. But I did all the work of managing their time. Each student, had, again, had to do eight hours in the lab. When we first proposed this, um, I said most, the, I thought I could handle over six students. And the director of the lab, who was the instructor of record, said, I think we should have 10 students. And I said, no, I can't handle 10 students. That's a lot of work. Because if each student has to do eight hours a week, that's a lot of work. And he said, well, how about eight students? And I grudgingly agreed. And then we added a ninth on the first day of class. Nine students was just too many. Even when we went down to four and then to five or six, it was still kind of too many. I mean, if you think about four students, each doing eight hours a week, that's roughly a full-time employee that I have to now manage and find meaningful work for. So my role was to coordinate all of that project work, make sure that everyone was doing the eight hours a week that they agreed to do. Um, I would lead weekly uh, project management meetings where we would talk about concepts related to project management. And I would do all of the tool and technical trainings. Um, in the last iteration of the class, we did a tool a week kind of workshop, and we would bring other folks in to do that instead of having me do that. I actually wanted the students to each lead one, but um, that, that kind of fell through the cracks. This is an example of one of my agendas for the, I guess this is the spring semester, so the second time we taught this, the kinds of topics we were teaching. So you'll see they're, they're getting training in the tool and in data. We're talking about the, data, the project life cycle, design phase, we did a lot of user experience design, implementation, testing, evaluation, final reflections. So again, very rapid, but trying to be kind of holistic here. I set up a Google spreadsheet for everyone to log their hours, and each student had a tab in this worksheet. And my purpose here was that I wanted everyone to hold each other accountable, to be able to see who was clocking in and who was, wasn't clocking in and hoping that they would kind of police themselves. It didn't really work that way, but at least we tried to make things open and transparent and, and raise accountability that way. Students performed a wide range of work in the practicum from what they would describe as tedious and boring data entry and data verification to much higher level um, conceptual project planning, data modeling. Some served as project managers, others went into classes and worked with faculty on their projects. Um, some did research and interpretation and other kinds of things, and it really ran the gamut. But again, it depended on what the needs were at that moment in time, that particular semester. So some of the problems that we had, we had really uneven work experiences and workloads. 
when all of the students were working on a project at the same time, I could guarantee that they were all doing roughly the same amount of work and the same type of work. But once those projects ended, they were just sort of released into the wild. And some students excelled and others floundered. And as with past experiences, in theory, I was supposed to be overseeing them. But in practice, it became very difficult to manage all of them on top of all of the other staff and all of the other work of the lab. Um, the nature of the work that they did didn't always span the methods and principles that they were studying. And often, uh, they would complain about how boring the work was, as if DH work is glamorous and always fun and exciting. And um, that always annoyed me. And I, would always, I always made a point of having them see me do that same so-called tedious work, that no one was above it, but some students really disliked it. Uh, we had a mismatch of project life cycles and semesters. So in the spring of um, 2014, students came into the practicum right as we were about to launch a major project. It was a great opportunity, though, because I was able to throw them all into the project. They helped us all launch it. And then mid-semester, they started over again with a new project, which for some of them was a little disorienting. Um, the most important problem was that there was a serious, unequal distribution of labor between the instructor of record and me. So while the instructor of record would teach the seminar, all right, we're going to read these articles and talk about them, and I'm going to grade your final paper, which was a DH grant proposal. I was doing all of the heavy lifting and not getting any credit for it, any compensation for it. It was exhausting. Um, and I had trouble finding meaningful work for each of the students, maintaining that student accountability, providing all of the training and oversight. And even when we tried to look outside of the lab for some of that support, it still was very difficult. But there were some really wonderful payoffs. Um, there were some students who really um, who really were transformed as a result of the experiences they did and went on to lead their own projects. Some of them helped launch projects that were very public facing. This was a project mapping Lebanese migration to North Carolina in the early 20th century. And all of the students in the practicum helped finish this, and their names do appear on this project, which luckily is still very much alive. So um, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to um, try to wrap this up by just gesturing to some of the problems with bringing DH into the classroom, and then some of the possibilities. So I've already alluded to a lot of these challenges. Um, it can take a lot of time on part of the, the professor, more time than other classes, um, because there's so much front-loading, there's so much staging. And even if you have a class where students are defining their own project work, there's still so much work you have to do to make sure they don't derail midway through the semester. There's the uh, long-term persistence problem. The question of how, what is our commitment to preserving these projects for a longer period of time than one semester. Um, tools can be really limiting depending on what we choose and what we have access to. Um, and the tools can really be obstacles to our teaching and learning. Um, and it can be hard to develop trust, trust in the, the quality of the work that your students might be able to do. And your students might have trouble trusting that you are there with their best interests at heart. Um, in terms of getting started, it can be really difficult to access the training that you need. Um, often we don't know what kind of training we need until we're midway through the course and then we realize, oh, I, I didn't think about this. How am I going to get that figured out? Um, that time commitment is really hard, even when you're just taking maybe like a module of your class and making it DHE. Um, it's really important to have someone filling that role of project manager in your class, I think. Even when the students are doing their own self-directed projects, you need someone to help with that component of it, but how do you access that? Um, and then how do you make the conceptual leap to not just add tools to your teaching, but to really transform the kind of, the, what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it? Some lessons learned. Um, it's really hard when you've got a real project that has real deliverables and a real deadline to throw it to students and trust that if it's too high stakes that you can trust that It'll be fine, and you'll have time to vet it before it launches. That can be really tricky. So there has to be some balancing of the stakes with the quality control. Um, I think that we've done better in the past when we've assigned bounded projects rather than pieces, parts of different projects. It's a more holistic um, experience for the students, and they can really get an understanding of that project life cycle. It's really, really important to rethink assessment in this environment. Um, balancing, if not favoring, process over product. Uh, Mark Sample, who uh, is in digital studies at Davidson College, has his students write failure blogs every week. 
where they blog about something that didn't go well, and they reflect on why it didn't go well and how they might change course the next time around. And I think that that's a really valuable way to reframe assessment in the classroom. Um, it's also important to think that not all DH projects fit all classes, and not all approaches fit every class. And so trying something in one class and succeeding doesn't mean you'll succeed in all of the classes. There are some ethical considerations to keep in mind, particularly when we're bringing um, our own classes into a classroom for students to work on. Um, and that's the, um, um, the reliance on unpaid labor. So um, we can't just say, well, we can't pay you for this. We'll give you course credit, and that's the same thing. It's not the same thing. And even when we mask it as, oh, but you're learning valuable transferable skills, um, that just masks the potential exploitation. Um, he, uh, Spencer Corrales, who's a librarian at the University of North Texas, argues that this is a deficit internship. Students pay for the privilege, either through loans or through their parents taking out loans or paying for their tuition, to work for free on a project, and they might not even get um, credit for that project. That is, their name might not appear in the project credits, although it would be a good idea to list their names. Um, he also says that a lot of faculty think that like, bringing the crowdsourcing ethos into the classroom is a great way to do it. And with crowdsourcing, people sort of willingly participate and often there's something like a gamification or badges to make it more fun to participate. But that doesn't work in a classroom because students can't freely choose to work on a project. Because they might be afraid, well, if I say no, what kind of retribution might there be? There's an uneven power dynamic in the classroom that we have to acknowledge. Um, further ethical considerations. Not all project work is really appropriate for the classroom. So you really need to ask yourself, why do what do students gain by working on something like transcription or data entry, which some people call mechanical, non-substantive labor. I, I take issue with that. Um, but if we're just asking them to do data entry, if we're just asking them to do, do transcription without the interpretive and analytical work that Marty got to do on your transcription project, um, it's, it's, it's devoid of that kind of meaning and learning uh, possibility. So it can't just be about, I need to get this project done, and I don't have any money, so I'm just going to throw it at my students. That can't work. And then when co-teaching, particularly with graduate students or staff, um, we have to acknowledge the potential to exploit that student or staff member who might not be able to say no and doesn't get credit in the same way that faculty do for teaching. Further, just some dangers really quickly, and I know I'm just about out of time. Um, I think it's really dangerous to sell DH classes as teaching real-world transferable skills because this devalues the humanities writ large. It somehow suggests that any other humanities class does not teach real-world skills, but in fact that's what we're in the business of doing, though we don't use that language. We are teaching people to think critically, to make arguments with evidence, to be good citizens. That is the most important real-world skill we can give anybody. And to say that somehow when we throw DH into a classroom, we're teaching more valuable skills is really risky for, for what we're trying to do. Okay, so I don't think that I have the answers to how to do DH the right way. So I'm going to suggest some better practices. Um, and again, this is not a one-size-fits-all, or if you do all these things, you'll be great. Um, but these are just some things that I've learned along the way. Um, first, we want to teach from an ethical standpoint. Find ways to avoid coercion, provide meaningful alternative assignments, um, provide, find a way to provide proper compensation and credit, which can be very difficult. Um, while we never did this in the lab, and I really regret this, I think it's really important to employ Creative Commons licensing for your students' work. Number one, it's a great way to teach students about intellectual property and um, scholarly, the production of scholarly knowledge, but also it actually protects the work that they contribute to whatever it is they're doing. It's also good to develop and adopt a mutually agreed upon set of guidelines and principles. And um, I've, I've outlined here, but I'm going to skip over it. Um, the Student Collaborators Bill of Rights out of the DH program at UCLA that Miriam Posner and her students came up with. Um, really great set of guidelines for how to be ethical in our teaching. Um, and you can Google that and find it pretty easily. Or I, you can email me and I can send you the link. Um, they do argue that students should be compensated if you're giving them an internship, um, it has to be a meaningful internship with lots of mentorship. Students should get credit, be listed in the project. 
Um, they argue only for substantive contributions. I disagree with that. Any contribution should be listed. Um, they should be allowed to present their work on that project and to add it to their C empower to add it to their CV. Um, we need to find ways to make our DH work meaningful. We're not just adding tools and stirring. Um, we need to choose, choose, choose tools wisely and when it makes sense. That work and those tools need to be transformative, not just for the learning that happens, but for our teaching. Um, and we shouldn't just be emphasizing the technical skills that students might acquire by doing this work. They're not just learning tools and technologies. We're using these tools as a way to teach them either content or methodology in a particular discipline. There's something else that needs to be happening there to make it meaningful. We really need to examine our motives and why we want to bring DH into the classroom, whether as a component piece or um, the whole make it digitally centered, whether it's our own project or their own project work. And recognize that while we gain a lot, we also lose a lot. We can't teach everything in a given course, in a given semester. In terms of getting started, um, Ryan Cordell, in his piece, How Not to Teach Digital Humanities, argues for ways that we can make it a little bit easier to teach. And while he's giving examples in a specific classroom, I think that these apply to our own evolution as, um, as teachers. And one is to start small. Um, don't try to do everything in a single class, in a single semester, but just try a few things out incrementally. Try something here and then there. Don't try to do too much at once. Maybe don't start with a completely new DH-centered class, but do a DH module in an existing class. We want to integrate whenever possible. So we do want to be experimenting with tools and figuring out when they might work in a class. They might not always work, and so we have to be a little flexible and playful with that. But he does encourage us to integrate as much as possible. He encourages us to scaffold everything. So when you have a big project, you know, you, we have all these milestones along the way. Well, think about your teaching in that way as well. And scaffold your goals over many semesters and many courses. And he also encourages us to think locally, whenever possible, rely on local content, local uh, resources to develop projects. And I would just add, don't go it alone, if you can. There's always ways to find collaborators, um, find ways to meaningfully collaborate in a way that's non-exploitative, that gives everybody the credit they need. But try to find collaborators, making sure that that work is fairly distributed. And seek out help and training. Uh, the Institute for Digital Research and the Humanities offers lots of fabulous trainings, including several this week in advance of the DH Forum. Um, and there's many opportunities more. And if there's something you need that, you, um, that isn't being offered, you can talk to either IDRH or the libraries or CTE or any number of places and make a request and we can build something. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and open it up. Thank you. Specific roles of a project manager would be in that context. 
Sure. Um, so there were a variety of ways that we identified clients. Um, <clears throat> some were clients that we worked with before who we just sort of hit up again. We're like, hey, you had a great experience with us the last time. Why don't you come back again? Um, sometimes I would be asked to just chase down leads that might come from the newspaper or from a conversation that someone had with someone over coffee. Um, um, and oftentimes it was kind of cold calling. So we had hit, we had um, a, 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 it was kind of hit or miss with that. Um, when you're cold calling someone to try to work with them, it's really hard to get their buy-in. You really need them to come to you. And of course, if you're trying to pitch a project to, and sell it to a client that you've kind of already defined, it's really hard to, one, it's the buy-in, but two, you're sort of saying, here, I'm going to give you this project, rather than having the client truly help create the project and feel ownership over the project. So it was sort of, we had uh, a different, it really kind of depended on the context there. In terms of the project management, so what my role was, was in part to train the students in the tools and communicate to the developers any problems and then communicate the solutions back to the students. Um, but also to keep them on track, make them make sure they were hitting their time frames. The first time we did this, we had no milestones whatsoever. Um, I, it was my first semester of my master's program. I didn't know what it meant to be a project manager, so we were really feeling around in the dark. But we slowly added more structure to the class and made them do uh, assignments to get them ready to get that project done um, in you know, 14 weeks or something. Um, so the project management piece is sort of uh, managing the resources, whatever kinds of resources they are, making sure we're on track, making sure we're meeting the original goals of the project. Um, I personally suffer from scope creep really badly, so we might have an agreed upon set of parameters for a project and I will forget that and just like go down the rabbit hole. And that's actually really bad for a project manager because you really got to kind of rein people in. Um, and then kind of represent the project publicly. So the first time we taught that graduate class in American Studies, each team had its own project manager. They were responsible for hurting their team. They were responsible for the reports back to us. They were responsible for presenting the projects in public forums, including the class and in a virtual symposium that we put together that semester. So, I mean, maybe I missed something here, but if, you want to teach or use digital commands in the classroom, but you're not working with a client. You don't have that in your classroom environment. Let's say you, you're teaching a topic and your idea, my idea, is that I'm going to have my students build a wiki around what it is we're doing over the course of the semester. How do you recommend scaffolding and structuring something like that? In the same way, just work with some basic dates, etc., or are there other things that we should consider incorporating or not incorporating here. Yeah, and really, again, it's not a one size fits all, but you can think about different sort of mini assignments that will get you to whatever that final product is that you want. Um, so imagining what it is you want the students to have at the end of the semester and then working your way backwards, um, mm -hmm. you know, reverse engineering that so that you then break it into its component parts and figure out, okay, if this is the final product and we have this much time, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether it's a client or the students define their own projects. But we need to provide that structure, I think. And so we need to sort of think through that process. And inevitably, we're gonna miss something along the way. So we have to be flexible and allow for some change and fluidity as well. But that's also part of the process. Do you see, if you let students define their own product, projects, do you see the same set of ethical concerns being there? Or do you see those largely as being unalleviated? I think it depends on the nature of the project. Um, when the students that I worked with were defining their own projects, about half of them defined projects that were related to their research, and half defined projects based on internships they were doing, where they went to the, their internship host and said, I want to do this tie-in to something we're working on. How can I do that? They were kind of uh, responsible for determining the boundaries of that. I think it does alleviate a lot of the ethical concerns because um, they're not doing labor that advances someone else's work, it's, it's their own coursework. Um, and I do still think they need to think through Creative Commons licensing or something like that to make sure that the work they're putting out there is 
is um, put out in a way that is ethical to what they want done with it. Um, but it does alleviate a lot of the problems. So a lot of this literature about the ethical considerations of DH, it's more directed at faculty who have their own project going on that pull it, it into the classroom. So an example would be, um, we were working on a project on Lebanese migration in North Carolina. A faculty member in the lab was teaching a family history class and said, oh, I'll have the students do research on Lebanese families as a way to teach them how to do family history research, and then it will contribute to this project. Mm -hmm. And the students complained that they felt they were being exploited um, in their course evaluations. And they felt it was busy work, that it, it was extra work they didn't need to do to learn the methodology, and they thought they were just being used. In the instance where they're doing their own kind of work and it's not serving someone else's interest, where the DH component is more of like a way to publish or distribute the end product, um, can you talk about the ethical implications of requiring them to publish something like that or, or how to build that into the Yeah, syllabus? and you have to be really careful about that. I, I never, you have to give students an option out of that because some students don't want to put themselves out there. Um, we, in the past, when we've done class blogs and things like that, we give students the option of using some sort of um, other identifiers or non-identifiers so that they their name is not out there. Because we do have to be concerned about FERPA and things like that. So you have to give students, students meaningful alternatives. And you can't penalize them if they don't want to do a public-facing project. Sometimes we've done things where we put up a project online and made it password protected, or we took it down as soon as the semester was over, we limited access. We have to do things like that. And it has to be on the students' terms. And we can't penalize them in their grades if they opt not to do that. So, so the undergrad component was largely left out of a Mellon initiative. And your vantage point, we're on graduate students. And, and one of the concerns is about the different kinds of skills or the lack thereof that each student brings in, and all of them are very different. And so, in thinking about undergraduates, could you identify particular things that, among your graduate students, that you were like, wow, that would be really great if they had this at an undergraduate level? Or how to, how to think about what kinds of maybe in the module sense, or the not necessarily skills and uh, delivery of public projects, but smaller things among graduate students that could lead to better participation as graduate students in a project like that. What I was missing? The biggest thing we can do for our undergraduates and therefore our graduate students is teach them digital literacy. Um, that is, what it means to participate in digital and online environment and all of the implications of that. Um, you know, students might be very comfortable in a social media environment, but that's that. how does that translate into other environments? How does that translate to how they make sense of the internet and the massive amount of information on the internet and the value of, or the differing values of the information on the internet? So I think that that's a pretty universal skill that we can and should be teaching. Um, that can then translate into particular disciplines, particular projects, particular methodologies, things like that. How about like teamwork dynamics, right? I mean, every class that I've ever had a student group in, and, and it's constant emphasis that there's always bad teams. I wonder if, how can I do that? Yeah, that, that's a really good question because um, the first thing I noticed when I got to my, uh, my information science degree program was it was constant teamwork all the time, and it was such a pain. Uh, and it took me a long time to realize like the key is to picking a good team, not picking something you're interested in working in, but finding people you can actually work with who will do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. Um, and I never learned how to do that. But yeah, I do agree that um, learning, um, helping students understand those team dynamics is very, very helpful. And the sooner we do that, the better. Um, I thought I heard something about core curriculum at the K-12 level starting to address things like this. Um, I thought I heard this on the news the other day. And I, I have mixed feelings about that because um, I think we need to blend, balance content with, um, with <coughs> other kinds of skills and methodologies. It shouldn't all be content and rote memorization, but it shouldn't be all skill building either, and so finding that balance. 
But in terms of how we can do this um, in the classroom, um, I mean, there's a lot of literature in other disciplines about teamwork that we could draw on about like how to get good teams working. A lot of project management literature talks about how to get teams through the phases from, let's see if I can get this, forming, storming, norming, performing, adjourning, warning. I'm not sure the phases of a team. I think I got all the there. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. But, um, and finding maybe low stakes ways of teaching them how to work as a team in class, either in class or in class projects. The tricky thing with um, having a sign of grades due attached to team projects is that students, well, everyone will figure out what they can get away with and still make sure the team, the project gets done. And so we need to make sure that students are allowed to assess each other in a truthful way, not just a, I'm mad at this person because they didn't show up ever. But we have to think of ways of assessing team dynamics such that we can acknowledge that that happens and find ways to help our students do better. So, want to just allow the group to fire a member? I mean, seriously, let a brain group come before the professor and wire back this person hasn't done their work. I've tried to do that in the past. And Didn't work? No, in fact, they'll say, no, you have to work with that student, figure it out. Right. It's, huh. it's terrible. Yeah, I mean, if you're also just random question on undergraduate stuff, I mean, if you want to try and just introduce undergraduates to switch digital humanities and say your history classes, be it the surveys or you know, other divisions. What are some projects that you would do that you could that it wouldn't take them a lot of time but it would give them some good practice or experience to and for you to introduce them to, to such things? It's a really good question and unfortunately I don't have nearly as much experience in this, but um, I've worked with faculty who taught undergraduate classes and tried to do small DH projects. Mm -hmm. Um, some were transcription projects. I was working with an archaeologist who um, had found these great ledger books from the largest plantation in North Carolina and was having her students help transcribe it as a way to learn about everyday life on the plantation. Um, but again, it was attached to something more than just the act of transcription. Right. I was working with a faculty member at American Studies. We were, it was a class on women in, American, women in detective fiction. And the students each had to read a Nancy Drew book. And then we, um, we created a data set around each of those books to look at um, different elements of each book and then tried to map it, which proved very difficult because Nancy Drew is set largely in fictional places, so how do you put it on an actual map? Which we didn't think about when we set up the project, and then halfway through we're like, oh, this is a problem. Um, I've worked with faculty in um, history classes who've created public exhibits with their students, where they the students were broken up into groups and did interpretive work in a digital environment on a particular part of a, a larger exhibit. Um, I also worked with a ge geographer who had students do oral histories and then we coded the oral histories um, thematically across all of the oral histories and then sort of visualized them as one. Um, and that was a project that was part of a larger effort that um, but was a small a sort of pilot for a, a long-term project that the faculty member envisioned but it's still sort of hidden behind a password and um, no one really can access it. But it was a way to teach the students um, how to code oral histories and how to read across a body of oral histories and read their own very deeply. Um, so this is something that's come up in, in conversations I've had before about thinking about how to do student work and, and preserve it and something that you mentioned a couple of times is you know, lamenting certain projects that are no longer preserved or ones that is can, um, as a way to sort of um, address the preservation and long-term access issue of projects, can, do, we, do these projects have to be public? No, they don't, especially if what we're doing in the classroom is teaching, using DH to teach something else, then we don't necessarily need to have that project persist. Um, uh, some students might want their projects to persist because they're proud of what they did, um, but there are other ways to archive it. So I try to film demos of all of my projects. Um, I try to screenshot them, 
um, that sort of thing as well. But and they don't all have to be public. Um, and I think that there are some DH projects that shouldn't be public um, because of ethical considerations related to the nature of what they're doing. Um, so, um, and one of the things that UNC Libraries is working on right now is um, working with faculty who want to do Omeka projects in the classroom. And what they've said is, um, we'll support it for this amount of time, but not beyond that. If students want to do something with it afterwards, you know, we can help them move it over somewhere else, I suppose. But it doesn't have to be a long term. Um, it doesn't have to be for forever, and it doesn't have to be public. Um, it's a follow up on that, I'm just trying to uh, shake it up in my head before I ask the question. Um, I guess it's a little bit of a pushback. I guess the biggest part of doing digital humanities is putting out knowledge in the world in a way that is available more broadly than it would be in other ways, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to, um, uh, I guess, to smaller projects. I mean, because they become um, tokens of, or snapshots, I guess, of, of student work that would never get access to in the form of just a like research paper that we would read. So in that sense, in what way is, does, does the meaning of the age project, projects change when they are public? Like, is there like an added layer if you make it public, or is, is it not? Do you mean explicitly for student projects? approaches to answer, ask and answer questions that weren't possible otherwise, but they're producing a, a convention, traditional monograph, and we never actually see and interact with the computational side of things. But And some people would argue that's not DH. I, I'm not going to be the arbiter of that, because I, I don't want to get into this is and that isn't. Um, but I think that there's more than one way to do this, and I think that one of the things we can be doing is thinking about opening things up. So what does student work look like? What do theses and dissertations look like? What forms could they take? If students want to make them open and available, that's great. If they don't want to, how do we create a space for that as well? Some students want to embargo their work um, for a certain amount of time. They, should they be forced to? No, but they shouldn't be penalized if they don't embargo. So I guess I'm trying to, I'm sidestepping the question and just saying everything should be possible. <laughs> That's good. To, yeah, to continue the, your um, conversation about assessment, uh, here at KU, those of you who are faculty, you know that we're all getting into assessment more and more than we used to. Um, it seems to me that if, that we should be thinking of, of ways to, um, to, to save the case studies that students make in class, not necessarily to make them public, but we should be thinking of ways to, to save them, to archive them, and to, to make sure that, that when it comes time to assess a course like the this course, um, mm -hmm. that the, the case studies are meaningful and that, and that the data that comes out assessment will be meaningful to, to faculty on a core committee, you know, um, you know, very shortly, it, it seems like those of us who are going to get involved in DH teaching are going to um, have to think of creative ways to present our students' work to a large percentage of the population of faculty who are not doing which I think will be a useful exercise because uh, through this process of assessment that we're starting to get into it here at KU, we're all going to learn more about how we're teaching. Um, so I think one of the ways that DH will, will become more accessible is through the process of assessment. Yeah, and that's kind of a double-edged sword because it suggests for a longer-term preservation of this work 
but not necessarily to benefit the student, although yes, because it makes us better teachers, but it's more to prove that we're hitting our marks. Um, so, um, uh, and, and that's okay too. Um, there are ways of preserving that that don't even require that public access. So again, we could be screenshotting things or, um, one of the things we tried to get students to do was to film demos of themselves explaining their projects and how they created their projects. And I think that can be very meaningful because then they get to articulate it in their own words and, and articulate the own, their own meaning and then walk you through what they envision the project meaning. I have another question. Um, so you when students produce public-facing projects as opposed to sort of more personal and, and non-shared projects, there are there are other um, data, data points that are potentially available, things like website, num like number of hits, mm -hmm. or social media shares, mm -hmm. or downloads. Um, should those kinds of um, metrics factor into assessment of the age project? Um, so I think it depends. Well, I'm going to say no. Because for me, I think the more important part of having students work, do this work is the process that they go through and what they learn in the process and not what they're able to produce or how many clicks it gets. Um, and so I think that that's what we should be assessing and not so much, not just the final product because some students might end up not producing a final product that can even be put out there. And that happened with several of our students where um, the, whatever it was fell apart or they just determined they couldn't do it and they went a different direction. And so, um, so it really, for me at least, it needs to be about the process. And that's where um, we can talk about learning outcomes and, um, and tie it to the core, um, which is, is I, I read it as a bit of a process-oriented in its intention. If I could maybe rephrase the question a little bit, is that something that as an educator you're interested in, um, especially in the context where you, you may work with a client and you can say, we delivered a project that gets this kind of viewership, or is that not that good? I, I don't actually put a lot of stock in those kind of metrics because, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to create clickbait and um, that is that the measure of a good project? Um, it was never really our job to disseminate the projects. We would hand it over to the client and leave it to them to figure out how they wanted to incorporate it into their institution and their promotional practices. So while that's an important piece of DH, I just, this just might be my own personality shying away from that part of it. It makes me nervous. But again, I don't have, all, I don't have the answers. And my way is not the right way. There's no single right way. But these are things that we need to think about and ask ourselves when we do this.